Thanks, Governor. <clears throat> thank you very much, Governor. And thanks for uh, giving me this chance to, to be with you. I'd like to just go through and almost table by table thank those of you who have been so helpful to me in teaching me about education and the struggles we have to help our schools do even better. Um, my co-author, Kurt Johnson, is here at the second table. I want, especially wanted to thank him for his patient tutorage. I just have, uh, my, my work at our school has been studying the problems of innovation. And a group of you came to me about 10 years ago with the proposition, you know, the struggles that we have to improve our schools at their core are all problems of innovation at one level. And so if you just be patient enough to let us teach you about the school system, maybe then you can help us examine the schools through the lenses of your work on innovation and see a few things that others haven't been able to see. And so we worked on this for about 10 years. And wrote this book called Disrupting Class that tried to summarize at that point in time what we had come to learn. And what I want to do as best I can in the limited time we have is to just first explain the models related to innovation that proved to be useful for us and then do my best to apply the insights from those models to our attempts to improve our schools. Now one of the things that um, we discovered is that the way we teach marketing in our business schools actually causes innovation to fail. And the reason why is that we teach, whenever you're innovating, you have to have a target that you're aiming the innovation at. And a lot of companies think that their market is structured by product category. So in the auto industry, you have subcompacts, compacts, midsize, full size, and so on. And they will then be able to list who are all of the competitors in those, those categories. And you then try to slot your innovative car into one of those categories in the belief that you compete against the others that are there. Other companies will segment their markets by customer categories. So you have low income, middle income, high income households. You have suburban and, and urban households. 18 to 34 year old females with and without college degrees. And you could go on and on. If you think that the world is structured by customer category, then you try to target your innovation so that it addresses the average customer in that category. And if you're in the company looking out on the market, that's the way it appears to be structured, and the data comes structured by customer and product category. And if you just reflect a little bit about how we conceive of the structure of the education market, in, in one way or another, we've, we've framed the structure by product or by customer category. The problem is that if you're the customer, that's not what the world looks like at all. If you're the customer, stuff just happens to you. Jobs arise in your life that you need to get done, and you actually hire products or services to do these jobs for you. And what it means is that understanding the customer is actually the wrong unit of analysis. You have to understand the job the customer is trying to do. And only if you do that can you then create a system that solves that job perfectly. So to illustrate this, I just wanted to go through an experience we had with one of the big fast food restaurants that was trying to increase the sales of its milkshakes. So if you walked in the restaurant, it was clear that they conceived of the structure of the product, of the, of the market by product category. Here's the menu board. You got the sandwiches, the desserts. Milkshake is a line item in the dessert menu. But these guys had been very sophisticated and had developed demographic profiles of the kinds of people that had a proclivity to buy the different items on the menu. So they had a profile of the quintessential milkshake customer. They would then invite people into, into conference rooms and ask them, could you tell us how we can improve the milkshake so you would buy more of them? And they'd get very clear feedback. They would then improve the milkshake on those dimensions, but it never had any impact on sales or profits whatsoever. So one of our colleagues went in with a different question that was on his mind. That is, I wonder what job people are hiring these milkshakes to do. So we stood in a restaurant for 18 hours one day, 
and just took very careful data. When did they buy it? What were they wearing? Were they alone? Did they buy other food with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or leave with it? And it turned out that nearly half of all customers bought the milkshake in the very early morning. It was the only thing they bought. They were always alone, and they always got in the car and drove off with it. So to figure out what job they were hiring it to do, he came back the next morning and stood outside the restaurant and confronted these folks as they were leaving milkshake in hand. And in language that they would understand, he essentially asked, excuse me, please, but I got to know something. What job were you trying to do that caused you to come here to hire that milkshake? <laughs> and as they would struggle to answer, he'd help them by asking, well, think about the last time you were in the same situation, needing to get the same thing done but you didn't come here to hire the milkshake. What did you hire? And it turned out that they all had the same job to do. They had a long and boring drive to work, and they needed something to do while they drove to keep the commute interesting. One hand had to be on the wheel, but somebody had given them another hand, and there wasn't anything in it. And they just needed something to do with that hand while they drove. They weren't hungry yet, but they knew they'd be hungry by 10 o'clock, so they also wanted something that would just stay in their stomach for the morning. Well, that's a good question. What do I hire to do the job? You know, come to think of it, last Friday I hired a banana to do the job, but take my word for it, never hire bananas. Because <laughs> they're gone in three minutes, you're hungry by 7.30. You promise not to tell my wife? I hire donuts more often than she'd ever let me. <laughs> But they don't do it well at all either. They're gone fast, they crumb all over my clothes, they get my fingers sticky. I hire bagels, but geez, they're dry, they're tasteless. If I try to spread cream cheese or jam on them, then I gotta steer with my knees, and then if the phone rings, there's big trouble. <laughs> I hired Snickers once, but I felt so guilty I've never hired Snickers again. <laughs> but let me tell you, when I come here and hire this milkshake, it is so thick and viscous that it easily takes 20 minutes to suck it up that straw. Who cares what the ingredients are? All I know is I'm full all morning and it fits right here in the cup holder. It turns out that the milkshake does the job better than any of the competitors. And the competitors are not just Burger King milkshakes, but it's bananas, donuts, bagels, Snickers bar, coffee, and so on. And then I could go into what the other jobs are that it's hired to do later in the day. But very different jobs. So then they invite me as a member of the demographic segment that has a proclivity to buy milkshakes. And they say, Clay, tell us how we can improve our milkshakes so you buy more of them. What am I going to tell them? Because in the morning I hire it for one thing, and in the afternoon I hire it essentially to placate children. And then they average my response with all of the other 35 to 55-year-old male slobs with children, and they come up with a one-size-fits-none product that doesn't do well any of the jobs that it's being hired to do. But you can see how, if you understand what the job is, then you, can, uh, then, then you know exactly how to improve the milkshake so it will do the job better. So if we just took the morning job, how would you improve it? Well, you'd want to make it even more viscous to take even longer to suck it up the straw. You'd stir tiny chunks of fruit in it, but not to make it healthy because they do not hire it to become healthy, but simply to add variety to the morning routine. And occasionally you'd just go suck up a piece of fruit. And, and then you would move the dispensing machine from behind the counter to the front of the counter and give people a prepaid swipe card so they could just dash in, gas up, and go and never get caught behind a line. And then the placate the kids job would be a very different system. But I hope that you can see why understanding the job rather than understanding the customer is the critical insight. Now it turns out that the great management theorist Peter Drucker figured this out a long time before we did when he said the customer rarely buys what the company thinks it's selling him. Importantly, understanding the job then helps you understand how do we need to integrate the activities together so that we can get the job done perfectly. So you notice that the restaurant, before they figured out what the job was, they had the product over there, the dispensing mechanism here, 
and the payments mechanism there. But once you understood what the job was, you could integrate the product with the dispensing mechanism, with the payment system in a way that allowed people to just get it done in a much more effective way. And that's the case in every industry that we've studied. If you don't understand the job, then you tend to be integrated in a way that's not relevant to what customers are trying to accomplish. What we've decided, and, and there's still a lot more work to do on this, is that education actually is not a job that our students are trying to do. But rather, education is something that they could hire to do the job. But the basic job that they experience every day is they just want to feel successful and they want to have fun with their friends. And so if this is the job I need to accomplish as a young, a, a young high school student, I could hire school to do that job. But just like the, the milkshake competes against bananas, donuts, bagels, Snickers, bars, and coffee, school competes against gang membership to do the job of help me feel successful today. Or I could drop out of school and buy a car and drive around the neighborhood and feel successful. Or I could throw my heart into athletic activities and feel successful. But in the, just as in the customer's minds, the competitors were not just milkshakes. In the student's mind, the competitors aren't just other educational pursuits. And in fact, much of education is structured in a way that does not help our students feel successful every day. And so a key reason why our students' motivation is weak, we have come to believe, is that our schools are improperly integrated. Instruction is typically uncoupled from the activities that help students feel success. So that's just one insight we got trying to look through the lenses of some of our work on managing innovation to understand this one dimension of the problem, which is why are our students seemingly more and more disengaged and unmotivated from school? And that is that education per se is something that they can hire to do a job, but it's not the job. And so in many ways, just like the fast food restaurant was improving the milkshake on dimensions of performance that were irrelevant to the job to be done, we race and race and work and work to improve education. But in some ways, from the student's point of view, that trajectory of improvement isn't relevant to the job that they experience. And it gets a lot more complicated because there are political jobs, there are parents who have jobs to be done, and so on. But I just introduced this as a way of thinking about that dimension of the problem. Now, another model that's emerged from our research that proved to be quite useful relates to um, what makes things affordable and simple and accessible. So you can, it turns out, characterize the history in geographic terms of many different industries as a, a set of concentric circles. And at the beginning, before sophisticated technology arrives in an industry, the problems tend to be encountered and resolved at the periphery. So in the history of the computing industry, uh, when I was in college, I just took my slide rule everywhere. If I needed to compute, I whipped it out, did the estimation, wrote it down, got on with life. But the advent of sophisticated technology tends to drive a centralization of the industry because the first manifestation of that technology is so complicated and expensive that only people with a lot of money and a lot of skill can have one and use one. And so in computing, it was the mainframe. Only the largest universities and the largest corporations could even afford one of those things. And it took extensive training to be able to operate it. Well, the very cost and complexity of that central solution, so we had to take the problem to the solution to get it solved, that complexity and inconvenience then drove a series of decentralizing innovations. And this is characterized not just in computing, I use this as an example, but in almost every industry to one degree or another. And so in computing, the first step of decentralization was what we called the mini-computer. And we called them mini because mainframes filled a whole room, but the mini computer was easily as big as that podium.
But by making it simpler and more affordable, now engineers could have these things in their own departments. And then the personal computer made it even more affordable and more simple so that we could have one in our office or our home. Then the notebook put it in our briefcase and the handheld puts it in our pocket and our purse. Every one of these innovations that drove the decentralization of the ability to compute did so by making a product that actually wasn't as good as its predecessor in the inner rings. But it was simpler and more convenient. And then as it got better and better, it drew applications from the inner to the outer circles so that we had to use the inner ones less and less until ultimately they just vaporized. And so a good example that's going on in your lives right now is most people don't buy the desktop machines anymore because the notebook is plenty good for all the computing that we need. And now there are a lot of people who travel not with the notebook computer, they just have their Blackberry because that's good enough. And so the applications at the beginning, we solve the simple ones in the peripheral rings and take the complicated problems to the center. But then as the peripheral products get better and better, it draws the applications from the center out to the less expensive, more convenient ring, and ultimately the ones in the middle collapse. Now one of the things that we observed was in fact because the initial products are so simple, the providers of the products in the center don't move out. And this is a model of disruptive innovation that emerged from our research, and I'd like to just go through that and then talk about, then try to apply it to education. So I'm going to plot on the vertical axis the performance of a product or service over time. And I've picked just three circles in computing. The inner one is the mainframe, the middle is the mini computer, and the outermost is the personal computer. Now in this model, there are two trajectories of performance improvement. One is that in every market there is an ability to utilize improvement. Now, there's a distribution of customers. So at the high end, really complicated problems, and at the low end, simple folks that can be overserved by very little. The other trajectory is that in each market, there's a different rate of improvement that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing better and better products. The most important finding about this is the trajectory of technological progress almost always outstrips the ability of customers to use the progress. And a good way to visualize that is if you go to the left-hand side in the mid-1980s when we were first learning to do word processing on those early PCs. Do you remember how often you had to stop your fingers to let Intel's 286 chip catch up to you? Because the world's fastest chip wasn't fast enough to keep pace with your fingers. But as Intel kept moving up that blue trajectory, a few years ago when they hit a 3 gigahertz Pentium 4, they had shot way beyond the speed that most customers could use. And that mismatch between the rate of improvement and the, our ability to utilize improvement is critical because when an industry decentralizes, typically it's on the left-hand side. It's not good enough for what most people need, so you can only do simple things. But then as it gets better and better, it draws applications from the middle out. Now, some of the innovations that help companies move up that blue trajectory are just incremental year-to-year -year improvements. Others are dramatic improvements. But it turns out that whether it's simple or radical doesn't, doesn't make a difference for the outcome because both of them are trying to sustain that trajectory of improvement that they're on. And what we found is that almost invariably, the companies that are the leaders in the industry on the left-hand side, before those battles of improvement begin, find themselves still leading the industry on the right. And it doesn't matter technologically how radical the improvement is. If it helps the leaders make better products they could sell for better profits to their best customers, they figure out how to get it done. But we saw a different kind of innovation, which was, as I've described, a decentralizing innovation, and we called it disruptive. We used the word disruptive not because it was a breakthrough improvement in the center, but rather, rather than sustaining that trajectory, it disrupted it by bringing to the market a product that was a lot more affordable and a lot simpler. 
what we found is that invariably the incumbent leaders dominate the battles of sustaining innovation and they always lose to entrant companies when one of these disruptions emerge. Now, let me come and bring it back to computing because in the Boston area where we've lived, there was a very successful company called Digital Equipment Corporation that through the 70s and 80s was probably the world's most widely admired company. And they made the middle class, the mini computers that were the size of the podium. Whenever you read explanations for those two decades of why digital was so successful, always it was attributed to the brilliance of the management team. Then about 1988, digital just fell off the cliff and began to unravel. When you then read explanations about why they had stumbled so badly, always it was attributed to the stupidity of the management team. <laughs> as the very same folks running the company. So for a while I framed the question as, gosh, I wonder how smart people could get that stupid that fast. <laughs> but then I realized it wasn't just digital, it was Data General, Prime, Wang, Nixdorf, Hewlett Packard, Honeywell. All of the mini computer makers collapsed in unison. And you'd expect them to collude on pricing occasionally, but to collude to collapse was a stretch. There <laughs> just had to be something more fundamental going on. And it turned out that this model was quite helpful in understanding that. So these mini computers, because of their complexity and size, they cost about $250,000 to buy. And the selling process involved a lot of training and support and service, and they had to be sold direct to the customer. And you just had to have those kind of costs in your business to play in that game. And given that kind of a cost structure, digital had to generate about 45% gross profit margins to cover the overheads inherent to being in that business. Now, during the 1980s, people were coming into senior management all of the time with ideas for improving their products. Some of these entailed moving up to the top of the blue trajectory making better computers than digital had ever made before. In fact, these would be so good that people wouldn't need mainframes anymore. They could draw the applications from the middle out to that next outer ring. If you looked at those business plans, they promised gross margins of 60%, and you could earn 60% on computers that sold for half a million dollars. Well, at the same time, management was trying to decide if they should invest in making bigger and better computers. Other people were coming and saying, now you guys don't get it, just look out the window. There are personal computers everywhere, that's the future. But when management looked out the window, they could see a couple of other things. Yes, a lot of computers, but do you remember how crummy those early personal computers were? In fact, Apple sold the Apple II as a toy to children. Not a single one of digital's customers in that middle ring could even use a per personal computer for the first 10 years they were in the market. And that meant that the more carefully they listened to their customers, they got no signal that the PC mattered because, in fact, it didn't to them. And then when they looked at the business plans, it got worse. Because in the best of years, the PC promised margins of 40%. They were headed to 20% quickly. And you could only earn those paltry percentages on computers that sold for $2,000. And so really the choice the management had to make was should we make better products that we could sell for better profits to our best customers? Or should we make worse products that none of our customers would buy that would wreck our margins? What should we do? And it's a very difficult dilemma for a company, even though the growth opportunities are extraordinary if they move out, because it doesn't fit the business or the plot profit logic, they can't do it. And that's why entrants typically do that. Now we got an insight that was quite useful to us. I'd been trained in material science and economics, and as my, the economics part had caused me to believe that competition always drives prices down, turns out that's not so. Competition on the sustaining trajectory actually drives prices up. So our hospitals, in order to compete against each other, just get bigger and better and more comprehensive. As soon as one has an MRI machine, everybody's got to have an MRI. When one gets a PET scanner, everybody needs a PET scanner just to compete. Or you go back, those of you who have put kids through college, 
Think about the nature of the athletic facilities 30 years ago versus what they are today, or the food service facilities 30 years ago versus these opulent food courts that we have today. But for Harvard to compete against Stanford, we gotta do it or they'll beat us. And so in healthcare and education, as the competitors in these inner circles fight with each other to compete, costs actually go up at a rate of six to 10% per year, just as inherent part of, of the way the world works. And what drives prices down is the disruptive decentralization of these industries. And so the, the healthcare industry, when I was a little guy, my doctor made house calls. The solution came to the problem, but the advent of sophisticated medical technology has driven a centralization of the industry. And do we think that healthcare will become affordable and accessible just by expecting our hospitals to become cheap? Or by expecting the physicians who practice there to take pay cuts? It just won't happen. But what we have to do is drive a decentralization of that industry and bring technology to nurse practitioners so they can do things that formerly a doctor had to do. And technology to clinics so you can do there things that formerly had to be done in a hospital. So it's by enabling lower cost caregivers and lower cost venues of care to become more capable is the mechanism by which healthcare becomes affordable and accessible, not by expecting the expensive ones to become cheap. And for those of you who have an interest in higher ed, the very same thing happens. The elite private colleges centralized higher education, and then state universities took it to a broader level at lower cost, and then community colleges take it to a broader population at even lower cost, and then online learning brings the learning to the student instead of the student to the learning. And so the, the colleges, they, as they compete against each other with the same business model, the costs drive up, but it's really allowing decentralization that makes it affordable. Now, in each case, when, I, as I mentioned, when the industry is disrupted and, and moves towards a decentralization, it's a, an entrant company that comes in and kills the leader. The only exceptions are when the leader in the inner circle created a separate business unit and gave it an unfettered charter to compete against the original business unit. So for example, IBM, when the mini computer disrupted the mainframe, they're the only mainframe company that survived into the mini computer generation. They did it by setting up a separate business unit in Rochester, Minnesota and giving it the freedom to create a very different economic model. And then when the personal computer uh, disrupted the, the mini computer, IBM was the only mini maker that made it into the PC world because they went to Florida and set up yet again a different uh, business unit that had a different business model. And now it's become a service company. And it's kind of like in biological evolution, individual organisms don't evolve. They were born, they die. But a population can evolve as the mutants gradually gain market share. And, and we've decided the same thing happens in the evolution of businesses. The business units themselves weren't designed to evolve. They were designed to do a particular thing, structured to do it very well. But a corporation can evolve by creating new business units and shutting down the old ones. And that's the way corporate evolution or change occurs, not by expecting the fundamental structural changes within the business model. And this would give you maybe a sense for why that is the case. So a business model is always built around a value proposition, which is a service or product that helps people do what they're trying to do to get a job done. Then they put into place a set of resources, people, technology, facilities, equipment, that they have to have to deliver the value proposition. Then processes coalesce as people work together to get to combine the processes to deliver the value proposition. Ultimately, then a profit formula comes to be defined. How big do we have to be to break even? What kind of margins do we have to generate to cover our fixed cost? The profit formula then dictates the value proposition that that entity can and cannot offer 
And very quickly, those elements of the business model become locked. And so any innovation that fits the business model just sails right through with little resistance. If an innovation doesn't fit the business model, then one of two things happens. One, it gets killed, or two, it gets co-opted. And let me explain a bit what I mean by co-opted. Just imagine you were a member of Congress. You came up with a brilliant program to solve a pressing social problem. You draft the legislation, introduce it. In three weeks, you get a visit from the relevant labor unions who say, you know, we monitor this stuff. You got to know this isn't going anywhere. But if you'll sit down with this and change this and change this and add that, I think we can live with it. And you got to have their support, so you modify the bill. And then you get a visit from the senator from Texas who says, I hope you understand my committee schedules the hearings for this bill, and I'm not even going to put it on the, on the agenda unless you add this and add this and add this and add this to make it good for Texas. And then the business lobby comes in and say they're going to block it unless you take this out and take this out and add that. And ultimately, it gets passed into law. But what comes out that end of the process is totally different than what went in. But in order to win the support of all the entities that have to vote for it, you've had to twist and shape and morph and modify your idea so that everybody who needs to support it gets on board. Well, in a company, the very same process happens every time there's an innovation. So never does an idea for an innovative product pop out of the innovator's head as a fully funded, fleshed out business plan. It's always a half-baked idea. And then you write up a business plan tentatively and you introduce it into the resource allocation process. Three weeks into it, you get a visit from the VP of sales who says, it's clear to me you've never been in the field before, have you? <laughs> you got to understand those customers that you're thinking about selling this to, we don't have relationships with any of them. Our salespeople can't make money selling that product. But if you'll sit down with me, I'll help you modify your, your plans so that it fits what we're good at. And if sales isn't on board, nothing goes anywhere, so you modify it. And then the CFO comes and says, we got a financial plan, and the kind of margins you're looking at won't help us achieve the plan, so I'm going to block it. But if you'll sit down and modify it with me, I think we can change things enough so that I can support it. And then you have the same conversation with manufacturing and engineering. And ultimately, the thing gets approved and, and funded. But what comes out that end of the process is totally different than what went on this end of the process. But in order to win the support of all the powerful people, you've had to twist and shape and morph and modify your idea so that it fits the business model of the company, not the need in the market. And that's the rub. And so the executives will sit at this end of the funnel and they'll see Me Too innovation after Me Too innovation dribbling out. And they'll shout up to the head box and say, hey, would somebody back there get creative? But what they don't get is that's not the problem. It's trying to deploy those innovations inside of the business model that was appropriate for the past that causes them all to be shaped in ways that fit the model, not the need in the market. So a key reason why our schools struggle to improve and are embattled in budget crises annually is that states have not managed well the evolution of the business model in public education. And just like it's at the level of corporation that the, the evolution of business models has to be managed, I think this has to be managed mainly at the state level, to some degree at the district level. Now, the next insight from our study of, of innovation relates to the architecture of products. Some products have what we call an interdependent architecture. That is, uh, er the design of each component in the product depends upon the design of each of the other components of the product. And Microsoft Windows is one of those. If you wanted to customize Windows to your unique needs, if you change 100 lines of code, you've got to change 10 million lines of code. It would cost you almost a billion dollars to get your custom version of Windows. The other type of architecture is modular, where each of the components fits together in clearly specified ways, 
And that, that architecture is easily configurable to the unique needs of each customer. Dell computers are like that. Linux as an operating system is consummately modular and customizable. It turns out that there are some intractable interdependencies in the way we teach. You can't teach this in 10th grade if you don't study that in 8th grade. You can't teach foreign language this way if we don't change the way we teach English grammar. We can't do project-based learning because our buildings were set up to have students in rows in monolithic classrooms. And because interdependent architectures are so expensive to, co to customize, the economics of interdependency is just driving us towards more and more standardization in the way we teach and the way we test. And just like Microsoft has to sell Windows as a one-size-fits-all product because of the cost of customization, the economics of interdependency is really driving the teaching in that direction. And that just butts up against the reality that we all learn differently. And the language of this is not yet mature because research is still very much in process. But there are multiple styles of learning, multiple types of intelligence, different speeds at which we can learn, all of which scream for customization. And that conflict between the need to standardize from a teaching direction and the need to customize from a learning direction is a key reason why our schools struggle to improve. So, in most classrooms, we are structured for monolithic batch instruction because of those interdependencies. And what that means is most students, therefore, aren't learning or they're learning very efficiently when they're being taught because of this conflict between the need to standardize and the need to customize. Well, how do you solve that problem? Really, having a teacher in the middle, as we've thought about it, is just an impossible problem because there are so many different needs to learn in the, in the classroom that the only way to solve that conflict in the middle, of, teachers have many ways that they add value in a school. One of them is by the delivery of content. And if we can migrate the delivery of content to software, software is inherently modularizable and scalable and can therefore mediate that conflict in ways that we could not as teachers have done it historically. Now the question is, why haven't our investments in computers resulted in the kinds of improvements that everybody has thought? And there's just another piece from our work that I thought might be useful here. I'll give a case study historically which is a study of the disruption of the vacuum tube. Now, you've got to have a lot of gray hair to remember these. But back in the 60s and 70s, consumer electronics were made with these devices about the size of a child's fist called vacuum tubes. And they came from companies like RCA, Zenith, Westinghouse, General Electric. As a result, a TV had 20 to 30 vacuum tubes in it. It had to stand on the floor. In today's dollars, it cost about 4,000 bucks. Uh, the transistor was disruptive because it couldn't handle the power that was required for it to be used in one of these big TVs or the big tabletop radios. Every one of the vacuum tube companies took a license to the transistor from Bell Labs, but they carried the license into their own laboratory and framed it as a technological problem. In other words, it just can't handle the power to be used in the market yet. As a group, they spent about $3 billion trying to make the transistor good enough that it could be used in the market. Where it actually got commercialized was in the next ring out. So the first application was a germanium transistor hearing aid, because you couldn't make hearing aids out of vacuum tubes. But then in 1955, Sony introduced the first pocket radio. And those of you that are old enough, do you remember how crummy those early Sony radios were? Just horrible fidelity, static-laced, my brother and I, we grew up in Salt Lake City. We bought one, cost two bucks. We had to face west to the Great Salt Lake in order to get reception. <laughs> but we were thrilled to have Sony's crummy radio because it was infinitely better than the alternative, which is no radio at all. Had Sony tried to sell its radio to our parents, it would have been judged as crummy because it really was in competition with what they had. 
And then in 59, Sony introduced the first transistor television, a little limited portable box. But by making it so much more affordable and accessible, a whole new population of people who didn't have a big enough bank account or a big enough apartment to have a big RCA machine on the floor, now they could have one. And because it was infinitely better than nothing, they were thrilled with the limited product. And so out in the green space, a booming new market emerged, and RCA in the back felt no pain. But then by the mid-late 1960s, solid-state electronics had gotten good enough that you could start to build big machines with it. And within about three years, the customers got sucked out of that inner circle or the back plane into the new one, and every one of the vacuum tube companies vaporized. It's a sad story, because it's not that they lack commitment or vision, but they simply tried to deploy it into head-on competition with the established technology in those applications. And the only way that it would have been used is if the transistor were more performance effective and cost effective in those applications at that time. That was a very difficult technical hurdle for RCA to overcome. But Sony, by deploying the technology against non-consumption at the beginning, it just had to make a product that was better than nothing. And then gradually it could improve and that's the way that all new technologies come into the markets. So the schools have spent about $60 billion bringing computers to classrooms. Why has it had no discernible effect? Well, we have done with computers in our schools what RCA did with the transistor. And that is try to deploy it in exactly the same business model and teaching model as we traditionally have had. And so it got co-opted. Uh, and, and has not had an immediate impact. So a key reason why computers have resulted in no discernible improvement is that they've been co-opted into the existing models of instruction. We're only beginning to use them in ways that are customizable for the way students learn and that have a transformative, disruptive ability to uh, make education more accessible and affordable. In fact, if you see where computer-based learning is taking root, it's competing against non-consumption and credit recovery, AP courses in small schools, homeschooled students, and so on. School boards have been moving up market, just like everybody does, except the vertical axis would be the political importance of programs. And so in our area, we, we lost the German teacher a few years ago because we just couldn't afford to have her. And then the statistics professor, or teacher lost her head. This year we lose psychology in our schools. Who knows when economics will go? Because we have to concentrate our limited uh, resources on the core um, courses on which standardized tests are being offered. And the, the message to the, to the citizens is just, well, you won't pay for it, we can't offer it. But this kind of a budget crisis is just a perfect opportunity to deploy uh, computer-based learning in ways that begin to teach students in ways that their brains are wired to learn. And so rather than say you can't take German, we just say if you really want German, register, but this, this hour go to the library and log on to apex.com slash German and take it online. And although it's no way at this point better than the wonderful German teacher that we had, because it's better than the alternative, will be delighted to have that technology. And then one by one, as we transfer courses from the back plane to the front, starting with the simplest ones first, the technology improves and to, to the point that um, it, things become affordable and accessible. I just wanted to have two more slides, and then I'd, I'd better end. When a new technology or a new business model takes over from the old, Almost always it follows that kind of an S-curve pattern, a gradual taking root at the bottom and then things take off and then asymptotically approach potential. One of the problems is that the leaders of the old approach are down there on the flat part of the curve and they look over on the vertical axis and say, you know, this new approach just isn't a big deal. They extrapolate out in a linear way, don't worry about it, the world flips on them and then they get killed. So in, in digital photography, or film, 
digital photography was on the flat part for about 10 years, and then in the early 2000s, the world flipped. Polaroid's gone, Agfa's gone, Fuji's gone, Kodak is barely hanging on. But it begs a question, Will the new approach flip next year, 10 years from now, or never? And there actually is a way to do it, to, to predict. So if you plot on the vertical axis the percent of the market that has accepted the new approach divided by the percent that's accepted the old approach, that still is hanging on with the old approach. So if they both have 50%, then that ratio is 1.0. And then you plot on the vertical axis the data on a logarithmic scale. And the reason you do that is that S-curve on the left is just a mathematical function. And if you do the math this way, it linearizes the function so that when the data comes in, the points all fall on a straight line. And because of the straightness of that line, you can project into the future when the new approach is going to hit 10%, 50%, 90% of the market. And it's always a straight line because of that S-curve. Sometimes the straight line is steep, sometimes it's gentle, because the S-curve sometimes is, is steeper or more gradual. So if you plot on the vertical axis the ratio of the portion of seat miles in courses in middle and high school that are taken online versus conventional instruction, it's uh, today less than 2%. But the slope of the data is now very clear. And so what it shows is that by the year 2014, 10% of all seat miles will be online. And by the year 2019, 50% will. So that's 10 years from now, on the scale of school reform, fairly dramatic change. Well, these are just a few thoughts about the future of education that came to our minds as we tried to study these problems through the lenses of our work on innovation. And I hope that as we try to dig to the root causes of why so many good people work so hard to eke out improvements, that some of these thoughts might be useful. I think at 3 o'clock we have a time for a Q&A, and I'd sure love to have you shoot cannonballs or questions or criticisms at me. And if I could be useful to you um, in any way, I just work at the Harvard Business School, see Christensen at hbs.edu, and I'd love to just bounce ideas around with you if, if you would like. Well, thanks, and God bless you for all that you're trying to do. Thanks, Governor.